All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, targeted maximum likelihood estimation uh, and how we might incorporate it into modern uh, neural network architectures uh, and training regimes. So we're primarily concerned with an observational distribution where we have y, uh, which is some outcome, let's uh, assume it's binary for now, a uh, set of covariates x and assignment of treatment t. So x might be high dimensional, we may have a number of covariates, uh, and the relationship between these is described by our, our probabilistic graphical model as follows. So we have x, which is a common confounder for both the assignment of treatment and the outcome variable y. And what we're primarily interested in is this, uh, the parameter that describes the influence of treatment on our outcome psi. So if you have a linear regression model, uh, this might actually be one of the regression parameters. Uh, but one of the advantages of targeted learning is that we don't need to make uh, unreasonable and uh, incorrect assumptions about um, the parametric distribution, uh, uh, using parametric distributions or, or sort of uh, parametric models. Instead, we're going to assume uh, the, the scenario described here is entirely non-parametric, and uh, so we can do away with all those uh, uh, difficult assumptions that may make our model uh, inaccurate and unreliable. So in that sense, this psi can be actually described as follows. Uh, it's the difference between the expectation of the outcome, i.e. whether someone recovers, given that we do give them treatment and given their covariates, all of this, the difference between this and the expectation of the outcome, whether or not they get better, given that they, you do not give them treatment, t equals zero, uh, and the covariates x. So this do notation here, if you're not familiar with it, um, have a look at do, uh, do calculus, and it essentially says that we're intervening on this variable t, regardless of what its original value was, we're going to intervene on it and set it explicitly to one and explicitly to zero. So the question then remains is how do we get these estimators for the outcome uh, regardless of whether we're using the inter interventional distribution or not, but how do we get the expectation for the outcome given the treatments uh, and the covariates? So what I'm going to argue is that we should train uh, an estimator Q0, which is a neural network. Uh, in the original targeted learning literature, it might be a super learner, which is an ensemble of powerful machine learning techniques trained using cross-validation. And this is going to give you the estimation for the outcome y given the treatments and the covariates. And this expectation means that we're looking at basically a conditional mean. So what is the conditional mean of recovery given the uh, covariates and the treatment? And if this outcome is binary, this becomes equivalent to the probability of someone recovering given the treatment and the, uh, and the covariates. So the problem with this is that even though we're conditioning on x and t, and conditioning on x actually theoretically removes this backdoor path that allows information to flow between t and y through x. And if you're not familiar with uh, backdoor paths, check out one of my other videos on the difficulties with estimating regression uh, parameters. The trouble is, is that even though we're conditioning on this x, and that theoretically removes this link, there's actually going to be some residual influence of this x due to things like, well, we've got a finite sample uh, and uh, we cannot fully uh, account for all of the correlation associated with x and t, especially if we're in the linear regime. What we're hoping is that this neural network gets us as close as possible uh, to getting us a reliable estimate for y given x and t such that this backdoor path is removed but actually in reality there's always going to be some residual bias which means that if we plug in this estimator uh, for the expectation of the outcome given covariates and treatment into this estimator for the parameter of interest psi we're actually always going to get some residual bias so we want to be able to deal with that bias so what we're going to do is actually explicitly model this relationship between t and x, i.e. the relationship between the covariates and the assignment of treatment. And we're going to give this uh, estimator a name, g0, uh, and this estimator is going to give us the probability of being assigned treatment given the covariates. So you might be wondering, what's the point in estimating this? Well, we're actually going to use it to uh, counteract the bias associated with the link between the covariates and the treatment. 
so initially we're going to use something very similar to inverse probability treatment weights, where this G is actually giving you something called the propensity score, which describes the likelihood of being a uh, given treatment, given the covariates. And so you're going to get these clever covariates, they're called, which are also, as I said, very similar to inverse probability treatment weights, where H is the name of this clever covariate, and we're looking at it for when treatment is assigned, i.e. 1, and for when treatment is not assigned, i.e. 0, and it's going to be equal to 1 over the propensity score for that uh, assignment of treatment or not assigned treatment for that individual uh, i. And so in reality, this is actually going to form a column in your data set. Uh, you're going to have both of these, but together they're going to form one column uh, because this describes a scenario whereby the treatment was assigned uh, and to that individual I, and this describes a scenario whereby treatment was not assigned uh, to individual I. So you can actually write this in one equation if you wish using some identity functions, uh, and you can combine them in that sense to get one expression for that column. But what the important thing is is that we're using this uh, clever covariates or IPTWs uh, to counteract the influence, the remaining bias associated between X and T. And so to do that, we're looking at updating our estimator for this conditional mean by taking the original estimator, Q0, and adding to it some uh, amount of these clever covariates H. And that amount is epsilon, which is actually the fluctuation parameter, and it describes how much our estimator is fluctuating due to these propensity scores, i.e. due to the residual uh, link between x and t. So by putting this parameter epsilon in front of it, we can actually uh, decide how much influence is being actually, uh, is actually still remains due to this, uh, this bias effect here. So you can kind of think of this while well, we take our old estimator and we add to it the inverse of the bias associated with uh, the assignment of treatment. Uh, and the covariates. Now this procedure gives you this Q1, this updated version of this conditional mean estimator. And we can actually stop there. And in the targeted learning literature, they show how just undertaking these steps will get you uh, far enough that when you plug in this Q1 into this equation here, so you essentially have Q1 for do t equals 1 and Q1 for do t equals 0, you actually get an unbiased and asymptotically efficient estimate for the for psi, the parameter that you're actually interested in. Now, what I wanted to discuss uh, specifically, in addition to targeted learning, which I've, I've kind of given you the nuts and bolts here, is how we might consider implementing it in a neural network framework. So what we have to be aware of is that what we're undertaking here uh, is, is uh, an update procedure which in this case was done in one step, i.e. we updated our original estimator once. And the second step should give you an epsilon of zero, i.e. your new estimator Q1, if you were to go through this cycle again, would give you an epsilon of zero because the influence of x on t is now taken care of in the first step. But in a neural network framework, we might want to actually incorporate this estimation of epsilon into the training procedures uh, for Q itself. Uh, so what I'm going to say, suggest is that we have a neural network that both, eh, both estimates the conditional mean but also estimates the propensity score at the same time uh, and we minimize the weights uh, as well as minimizing this value of epsilon. So in order to consider this, we should look at the loss. Uh, this estimator Q0 has a corresponding uh, uh, distribution associated with it, which we might call, uh, I'm going to actually call this P0 initially, and that has a corresponding epsilon associated with it, i.e. A, a corresponding degree of fluctuation due to the residual bias associated between x and t. Now if we take the derivative of this loss with respect to epsilon, we're able to see how much uh, the loss changes as we vary epsilon, i.e. this is the rate of change of the loss for a particular value of epsilon with respect to epsilon. And so this should be kind of ringing, uh, I guess not alarm bells, but uh, sort of ringing some kind of bell to suggest that, okay, well, maybe we can incorporate this into uh, a gradient descent optimization pr procedure. And so what we're going to be looking for is to minimize the loss 
uh, subject to find subject to finding also the minimum value of epsilon. So this will become clearer as we go further down the board. And actually, uh, as a sort of side note, when epsilon equals zero, the score, and this is the score here, the derivative of the loss with respect to epsilon is actually equal to the efficient influence curve. Uh, and so that's, um, yeah, I guess a bit of a side note. So in a neural network framework, we might be looking at achieving the following. We start off with an initial estimate of epsilon, epsilon zero, and this is actually equal to uh, epsilon such that we minimize the loss associated with this, uh, this original distribution estimator Q zero. And so this describes this here, P zero is the distribution associated with Q zero. This is that uh, original value of epsilon. And OI describes the fact that we're calculating the loss over the observations, set of observations I. That gives us a new, allows us to update the, uh, the estimator to get Q1, and then we repeat. But the trouble with this is again, that even though we can go through this algorithm and keep updating our neural network accordingly, this isn't really a gradient descent formula. So I'm going to look to work uh, that was recently carried out by Xi, Bly, and Veach. Um, this was at Columbia. Uh, and they incorporated a neural network uh, regularizing um, term into the gradient descent loss objective. So what they said is that we want to minimize, uh, we want to find theta, sorry, we want to find theta and epsilon such that we minimize this equation here. Uh, and that will give you the value of epsilon and theta. And when epsilon equals zero, then we're actually at that uh, efficient influence curve optimal uh, point there. So they've got minimizing this here. R ends up being the loss associated with estimating uh, Y given the covariates and the treatment. So that's your regular, say, cross entropy, uh, sorry, binary cross entropy loss if you're interested in just predicting the outcome, which is binary, plus this regularizing term, beta times one over N times the sum uh, of this gamma I term here, where gamma I is actually equal to yi, the true outcome, minus the original estimator, or at least the current estimator uh, for yi, plus epsilon times h, where h is the clever covariates that we uh, described above. So in order to get h in the neural network procedure, we would actually make this g0 another neural network, such that we're actually using that during training as well. So none of this will actually be optimal as we're training, but the idea is, is that if we use this during training, then we'll be simultaneously achieving a, a solid estimator for Q0, a solid estimator for the propensity score. Uh, that will allow us to also calculate this expression here. And then once we've minimized it, we can evaluate the network's ability to give us a reliable value for psi, our parameter of interest, using this here and plugging in our expression for Q0, our, our, sorry, our neural network for Q0, uh, given that we do t equals one and given that we two, do t equals zero. So I hope that's helped uh, sort of contextualize targeted learning and how you might incorporate it into um, a neural network architecture. Just for reference, the architecture that's used it already uh, in the work by uh, Shi, Bly, and Veach is called Adapting Neural Networks for the Estimation of Treatment Effects. Uh, their network is called DragonNet, uh, and it was uh, pre uh, presented, I believe, at uh, NeurIPS uh, 2019.